Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight, I want to talk to you on a subject of deep concern to all Americans and to many people in all parts of the world, the war in Vietnam. I believe that one of the reasons for the deep division about Vietnam is that many Americans have lost confidence in what their government has told them about our policy. Thou died now, right here fighting you. Are you my enemy. My enemy is the white people, not Viet Cong, or Chinese, or Japanese. You my opposer when I'm on freedom. You my opposer when I'm on justice. You my opposer when I'm on equality. To, uh, to, uh, stop the fighting. We are there only at the invitation of the four fighting, ex-fighting parties. How and why did America get involved in Vietnam in the first place? How has this administration changed the policy of the previous administration? What has really Vietnam is also the scene the of a Vietnam. powerful aggression what choices that is spurred by an war. appetite for conflict. What are the for <laughs> <It's called American laughs> How do you ask a man to be the last man to die in Vietnam? How do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? My name is Andrew Birch, and I'm the historian post-1945 here at the Canadian War Museum. Well, Canada played an official role and an unofficial role. Uh, we maintained membership at the International Control Commissions uh, from 1954 until 1973, uh, and a good many uh, Canadians also served uh, unofficially uh, in American uniform, as about uh, 20,000 or more uh, Canadians uh, went south of the border uh, to fight with American units uh, overseas. So there was an official component and an unofficial component of Canada's uh, involvement in the war, and there's an economic component as well in terms of um, uh, through the defense production sharing agreement, uh, Canadian firms and uh, industries did produce and develop uh, material for the U.S. war in Vietnam. Not at all. <laughs> uh, I don't have... Um, these are estimates. Uh, there's no firm confirmation. I've seen numbers as high as 30, 35,000, uh, as numbers as low, and in some cases as low as 6,000. Uh, the challenge being that uh, when people crossed the border uh, and enlisted, they didn't necessarily list um, their hometown as being Canadian. Uh, there was not, there's not really a method uh, to track it, uh, or there wasn't any sort of independent tracking that was uh, put on board there. Uh, the border was pretty permeable in that respect, and people were able to sign up in the U.S. Armed Forces and go overseas a little more easily at that time uh, than was the case in Canada, where they may have faced a waiting period or may not have liked the various deployments that perhaps would be on offer in the Canadian Armed Forces. So there's no official way to track it. It's more uh, word of mouth than unofficial estimates. The figure that I've seen, and one that's uh, um, recognized by the Canadian Vietnam Veterans Association is 143 uh, from the outset of the conflict to, through to its conclusion. Um, some, I believe seven of those missing in action, so joining the uh, many American and, uh, and other nations who uh, went missing in action in the jungles of Vietnam. Canada was uh, part of an international body uh, that predates um informal UN peacekeeping. It was a product of uh, talks at Geneva in 1954 following the uh, French defeat in uh, Dien Bien Phu. So uh, the French were in the midst of withdrawing from, uh, from Vietnam and into China, and uh, the talks at Geneva were looking at the ways in which to best facilitate that, and one of the bodies that was conceived uh, through those talks was the International Control Commissions uh, that would oversee military movements and uh, refugee flows in Laos uh, Cambodia and uh, Vietnam or Indochina as was uh, as was called then and the uh, ICC was kind of 
discussed at these Geneva talks, although Canada was not formally um, a part of those talks until their participation was suggested, uh, I believe by the Indian delegation and, uh, and recommended and forwarded by the British to essentially say that Canada could be a, um, uh, a relatively impartial figure on this uh, tripartite commission that would oversee fairly and objectively the movement of arms and to report on ceasefire violations to basically monitor the progress of the, uh, of the uh, uh, scale down of the French war in Vietnam and the uh, the, the separation of North and South Vietnam at the 17th parallel, uh, along with um, you know, Canada as a Western representative, India as the uh, representative of the, the non-aligned uh, bloc, and uh, to represent the Eastern bloc or Communist bloc uh, would be Poland. So there would be these three uh, groups representing uh, the three, three worlds, so to speak. Uh, that could then speak fairly and uh, and monitor and observe and report back on the implementation of the various measures of the Geneva Geneva talks, and so this was uh, recommended to Canada, and Canada uh, received the request and um, and in the end agreed to uh, participate, and this led to hundreds of Canadian uh, military and diplomatic officials serving in Cambodia, Cambodia Laos, and Vietnam uh, from 1954 to 73. The supply of materials to the uh, United States formed a bit of a domestic flashpoint uh, in between anti-war uh, activists and the Canadian government. Uh, Canada, by virtue of the Defense Production Sharing Agreement by the 1960s, had uh, essentially access to the American market and so was uh, providing and supplying and selling uh, ar you know, arms, munitions, uh, uh, chemicals, and including stuff like napalm uh, to the American uh, government and the American military uh, for use overseas. Uh, and this was in the order of some billions of dollars and it was big business. And there were representations to the Canadian Prime Minister at that time, Lester Pearson, uh, to terminate these and he you know, politely declined to, uh, to discontinue them as it was a product of uh, an ongoing defense sharing agreement as opposed to specifically targeted at support for uh, the American war in Iraq. However, it was characterized as such, uh, you know, by those who were opposed to the war. Uh, but it was a product of this uh, growing integration of Canadian and American military relationship that had been expanding since the end of the Second World War. Uh, and some viewed this as, you know, uh, as complicity, and others viewed this as simply, you know, good statescraft and maintaining good relationships with uh, one's neighbors. The composition of the International Control Commissions allowed for uh, Canadians to have eyes on what was going on throughout the country, throughout Vietnam, throughout Cambodia, throughout Laos, and conditions varied between each of these. But uh, the, the composition and function of the International Control Commission, uh, both the first and the second one, uh, basically facilitated uh, a, a place where discussion was kind of nil and the actual flexibility in reporting and frustration with the reporting structure led to uh, uh, you know, disillusionment with the role over time. That said, it did have its utility in that it allowed uh, Canadians to be present and to have some influence or hope to have some influence on affairs as they developed uh, and also provided an official response to well, what is Canada doing in Vietnam? Well, we're supplying uh, the, you know, diplomatic representation and military representation and observer teams uh, throughout uh, Vietnam and uh, Cambodia and, uh, and Laos uh, in support of these international uh, peace effort as opposed to we're sending a battalion or what have you to join the Americans in the fight for for South Vietnam. So uh, it, it served a diplomatic function, uh, a political function, and a military function all in one. And the first commission, the ICSC, pretty much by the mid-1960s, uh, as late as the late 1950s, the diplomatic representatives, the uh, Canadian political representatives, were already concluding that it, it was uh, a, a useful thing to have, but not necessarily uh, going to be of much influence because uh, 
the peace agreement never really materialized. Uh, both sides began to escalate. The U.S. became more involved. And uh, as a result, there wasn't much wiggle room for uh, an actual implementation of a ceasefire because both sides were interested in reunif well, reunification on the north side and, of course, uh, frustrating that from the American side. And there was not really a lot of wiggle room to uh, to guarantee. So there was discussions about disbanding or, or removing Canada's involvement as uh, as early as the mid 1960s, uh, but we kind of stayed on both to uh, uh, not to provoke unintended reactions and to uh, not disrupt relationships with the Amer with the United States and with India and with other countries, and okay. to uh, not perhaps have a deleterious effect on the situation in Vietnam. Uh, peace observers, as you rightly use the expression, we are not there to, uh, to uh, stop the fighting. We are there only at the invitation of the four fighting, ex-fighting partners who have invited us to be there. And our acceptance, of course, is, is, uh, is uh, predicated on the fat, fact that they have stopped fighting and will stop fighting. If they start fighting again amongst themselves, our men are not armed, they are not equipped to separate uh, two fighting armies, and uh, there's no question that we will uh, leave ourselves be caught in the crossfire in that way. Well, I think that it's, uh, it's certainly interesting that there were so many Canadians who served uh, both officially through the International Control Commissions and unofficially or, or through uh, with U.S. units. And uh, in our exhibitions here, we've uh, tried to describe both. And uh, in our permanent galleries, for example, we have uh, the, the uh, uniform of a Canadian who served in uh, with the U.S. Marine Corps in uh, Vietnam from 1971 to 1973, Sergeant uh, Rick Wark, uh, with, his, with his helmet and all his out outfit. And like many of these veterans, they served, some of them served exclusively with the U.S., and that was the term of their service. Some returned to Canada, like uh, Sergeant Wark, and served with the Canadian Armed Forces, and then ended up going back to the U.S. Armed Forces. So it's, uh, I think it's representative of the, uh, the close relationship militarily and uh, economically and politically that uh, has been built up by uh, Canada and the United States in the post, uh, post war period, uh, but also the complexity of this conflict in Vietnam, which um, you know people think of as just an American war, but in fact had uh, Canadian involvement uh, at the margins, uh, politically and diplomatically, but also uh, you know had very deep personal impact for many Canadians who served in uniform or who saw what was going on and chose to take action either against the war or to help house those who were uh, so badly affected by it. The language is different, the culture is different, and the climate is unlike anything they've ever known. But for the 161 Vietnamese refugees who spent the last five weeks on a freighter off the coast of Malaysia, Canada is now home.